Ride through the city like Brennan Shaw. I'm on a mission to get it all. Ride through the city like Brennan Shaw. If you ain't thick, please don't get involved. And now, Brandon Thick Boy Shaw. What is popping, kid? It is a gloomy, rainy Monday morning, November 7th. We have quite the fight coming up. We have the UFC return to Mass Square Garden. UFC 281 is going down this mother trucking Saturday. My boy Izzy versus Alex Pierre is your main event. Coming event, you got Carla Sparza, Wele. You got a uh, big boy fight, Dustin Poirier and Michael Chandler at lightweight. You got the fan favorite, Frankie Edgar, in his send-off fight. Not an easy fight. And you got Dan Hooker and... Uh, uh, fighting as well. I'm not mad at that lightweight fight in that prelims. Brad Riddell versus Renato Meccano is a great one. Dominic Reyes. Dominic Reyes and Dan Hooker, kind of in the same boat. They both need to get a win. Pretty bad. Pretty bad. We'll get in the card, though, but I'm looking forward to this one. Unfortunately, won't be able to do a fight campaign for this one because I'll be in Houston this Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Houston Improv coming to you live with the Thick Boy squad with the Oh He Thick tour. That's Houston this Thursday, Friday, Saturday. There's an appearance Saturday at the Specs in Houston. Let me check the exact address. Everyone keeps asking for the address. That's from noon to 2 on Saturday, and that is at Specs in downtown Houston. When I say downtown, I don't know Houston, so I'm just going to say downtown right now. That is the Specs at 2, was it 241? It, I think you're right on Smith Street. Definitely, definitely Smith Street. Yeah, it's 241 Smith Street. Baby, holler. That's from noon to 2. Come try that award-winning sweet, thick nectar. 2410 Smith Street, Houston, Texas, baby. Houston, Texas. I'll be there uh, with the crew. Come try some of that award-winning whiskey. Come get you some cases, uh, some bottles. We'll be doing giveaways. We'll have some cool stuff there for you guys. So that's Saturday in downtown Houston, Specs. Um, yep. And two shows that night, two shows Friday, one show Thursday. Houston, come get some. Next week, I'm in Milwaukee. Those shows are only Friday, Saturday. Friday is Milwaukee, hometown of Jeffrey Dahmer. And then first week of December, Providence, Rhode Island, December 1st through the 3rd. That, all those shows are most sold out. And then Washington, D.C., D.C. Improv is December 15th through the 17th. One of my favorite venues in all the land. Good to see you guys, though. Shout out to San Antonio. Had a great time in San Antonio. Shout out to 2M Barbecue, Hotel Emma, all of it, man. Had a grand old time. Let's get right into the fights, though, man. Um, you know, UFC 281. UFC 281 is here at Mass Square Garden. There's been some infamous fights at Mass Square Garden. That's where um, our boy TJ Dillashaw knocked out Cody Garbrandt. I think that's where Rose knocked out Joanna Yunjenchek. Um, there's been some big fights there, some really big fights. So um, it's a special thing when the UFC's in uh, New York, and this card has special written all freaking over it. Um, there's a lot going on on this card. Definitely worth your money. You know, it's rare I tell you guys it's worth your 80 bucks, but this one is definitely worth it. And the last one was too, but this one is fantastic. I like the prelims, my boy, um, Philly's finest, Andre Petrosky, fighting Willington. Uh, Truman, uh, you know I'm taking Andre all freaking day. Shout out to Andre Petrosky. You got Molly the Meatball fighting on there as well. As well, they gave her a tough matchup. They didn't do any favors with uh, Aaron Blanchfield. She's quite the underdog. I know she's cool with Jake. She's 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 mates with J Drake. I don't think the UFC cares. They did not give her a favorable matchup. Her and uh, her and Patty, are, are, you know, they're getting tougher fights, which is how it goes. Um, but th there's a there's a Underlying theme on this card, you know, there's there's some fan favorites, Dominic Reyes, everyone loves, Dan Hooker, Frankie Edgar, then you have two, uh, you know, Dustin Poirier. All those names I just mentioned really need a win. Really need a win. Dominic Reyes changed camps. He's over it with Glover Teixeira now. Um, obviously, I'm sure he did camp with Alex Pierre and Glover, so that should help him. Ryan Spann's not the easiest fight for the guy who's taking some time off, hasn't won a fight in hot second. Burst on the scene like a goddamn banshee. 
obviously had that uh, controversial fight with John Jones, and then now he's falling on tough times. So it's going to get dice for him if he were to lose this one. I think that'd be four in a row, Chin. Is he lost three or two in a row? I'm pretty sure it's three in a row with Dominic Reyes. Yep. Three in a row. He lost John Jones, right? Controversial. They probably don't hold that against him. Lost to Jan. All right. Guy was champ. And they lost to Yuri. Guy was the champ. So he's he's losing to the best of the best. Um, but yeah, he's going to have to. He's fought for the title twice. So it's like, this is an important one, man. God, he came out like a goddamn banshee. And I know he's smart, too, because, you know, he's suffered two pretty bad knockouts the KO spinning back elbow from Yuri and the TKO from uh, Jan. So. He's taking time off just to let his brain heal. Smart thing. Smart thing to do, but that ring rust is real. So Ryan Spann's no punk. They're not doing Dominic Reyes or Dan Hooker any favors with the matchups they're giving to these guys. So uh, listen, I'm siding with my boy, uh, Dom. Dom there, I think he gets it done. He's worked hard. But, yeah, they're not doing any favors. Nor should they. You know, he's fighting John Jones, Yeri, and um, – Yawn, so it's not like you're gonna get just some random dude. Ryan Spann's no punk. Um, then for Dan Hooker, same thing, right? He was messing around at 145, and then uh, 155 is probably pretty natural for him. He's won one out of his last five, um, he's lost his last two. So, you know, the dude hasn't won a fight in a hot second, and um, again, they're not doing any favors. The, the guy he's fighting is no punk, but you're also Dan Hooker, so what are you gonna do? These guys are in tough positions, man. Really tough positions where they're that you got to win. You got to freaking win. So you know the Arnold Allen thing was kind of a that was a tough one. That was a, that was a tough one. Uh, Arnold Allen, I told you guys, my dark horse for that division, especially at featherweight. So he decides to go down to featherweight and like, here's Arnold Allen Hooker. And he's also, I think, one of the reasons a lot of us cheer for him too is. He's such a good dad and family man. Remember, with uh, New Zealand and flying out of Australia, remember. They basically had to do an underground fight club out there. That's how strict it was. And he was getting stuck, and they're holding him in, you know, quarantine and shit. So the guy, you can't help but root for him, man. So, I, God, I'm really rooting for uh, all, all three of the guys. Real Well, listen, you got Dominic Reyes. We need him to win. Dan Hooker, you need him to win. And Frank Hecker, it's his last fight. Who the hell? And this isn't anything against Chris Gutierrez. Who the hell is rooting for Chris Gutierrez against Frank Yeager? If you're a goddamn American, who the hell is going to root against Frank Yeager? This send-off fight, Mass Square Garden, how dare you? Now, I know Frank Yeager won Dominic Cruz, but I like this for him. Unless it's also going to be Dominic Cruz send-off fight, then that's kind of fun. But I'm down for this, for Frank Yeager. Definitely down. He's always a tough one to beat. At least Chris isn't like a crazy knockout artist. The last thing anybody wants to see is Frank get knocked out, so... The one where I'm not going to pick, because they're two of my buddies, uh, is D Dustin Poirier, Michael Chandler. I'll talk about the fight, but you're, that's the only fight you're not getting a pick on out of me. Um, this fight has so many heavy consequences when it comes to the lightweight division, because the guy who loses, you jump way back in the queue, and there's some killers in the queue, and it's changing of the time. So, you know, you look at guys who ran the division forever. You look at Tony uh, Ferguson. You had Khabib there forever. Connor's doing his damn thing. Everybody's getting older. Charles Oliveira just lost. He's been in the UFC for literally ever since he was 21. Um, so you got Justin Gaethje there. Uh, Darius isn't exactly a young buck. Rafael Dos Anjos. Like, it, it's a bit of an older vibe, but you got these new savages coming in and kind of going to run things. So for Ju for uh, Dustin Poirier and Michael Chandler, it's like whoever loses this is going to fall back in the queue. And then there's guys like Darius who deserve a title shot. There's Fazeev deserves a you know uh, to be right up there. You got Gamrot just waiting the the freaking line there. So you got all these savages just waiting, waiting. Armin is a freaking nightmare. Jalen Turner nightmare. So it's like whoever loses this one. You, probably going to be a very tough path to get to a title shot. There's so many good guys waiting. So, you know, for Dustin, who he said he would only take a fight that would get him out of bed, get him excited. I thought it was going to be the Nate fight, but it ended up happening. Michael Chandler's a good one, and they have a bit of bad blood, bad history there. Mm -hmm. They almost fought at the UFC, if you remember. They don't like each other. Everyone, you know, Dustin thinks Chandler's fake, and they used to be training partners at ATT, so there's – a good uh, backstory there. It's a fantastic fight. Um, you know, you just got to wonder who is just going to be up here slower, who's going to make one mistake, 
and as far as knockout power goes, I'd give the advantage to Michael Chandler. So that worries me with Poirier going in this fight, but Poirier's damn near impossible to finish. So um, it's going to be a great fight. That has fight of the night written all over it, unless Chandler was to land one of his big bombs, which he's notoriously known for. But, um, you know, for Chandler, he's kind of the UFC's golden boy. You know, he was hoping for a gigantic fight. There's a lot of talk, you know, pairing him up with Connor. There's all sorts of chatter online about what his next fight was going to be. And he got a big one. He got a big fish on the line with Dustin Poirier, man, legend. So looking forward to that fight. Co-main event, I know you got Carla Esparza, who's just been on this savage streak to get to, you know, championship status. Um, I think three of those six wins or three of those seven wins. How many she won in a row, Chin? Six or seven? But a lot of those split decisions, right? So she's won one, two, three, four, five, six. So before that, she lost to, lost to Tatiana Suarez, who I thought was going to be champ. Who knows what's going on with her neck? Um, but she had a split decision or a majority decision. A lot of decisions there, dude. She's out, out of holy shit. Out of those six fights, they're all decisions except for one. Um, and then also uh, out of those six wins, out of those decisions, half of those wins are split, so they could go either way. So she had the win over Rose, right, to to win the belt. Um, she beat Marina Rodriguez. That's a good win. Split again. Michelle Watterson split. I just I, I just don't see her finishing, Whaley. I, I just don't. I don't see her finishing her. Can she beat her in a decision? I'm sure. I just, what were the odds? I would assume Whaley's a heavy favorite, Chin. Let's see. On DraftKings. Minus 350. Minus 350. Favorite. That makes sense. Poirier's a minus 280. Damn. Is he minus 180? Wow, wow, wow. Frank Yeager's a, a dog. Hooker's favorite. Thank God. That Brad Riddell, Renato, Massino fight's going to be fantastic. Petrovsky, our boys, minus 200. All right, Dom Gray is minus 225. Wow. That's surprising. That's that surprising. long of a layoff yeah. over Ryan Spann. Then look at our girl, Molly Meatball, plus 320. Yeah, that's big. That's a tough one. Carolina uh, uh, versus Silvana Gomez, Juarez. Even. Uh, Juarez is first team all baddie. Montel Jordan. Just kidding, Montel Jackson. <laughs> minus 205. Interesting, man. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, I, I just, listen, good for uh, Carlos Sparza getting the, the title and stuff like that and going on the six-fight win streak. I think the, the bus stops at, in China with Wele, you know? I, listen, Wele's only really lost to Rose. That, it, she beats everybody not named Rose. If your name's not Rose, you're probably going to get beat up. Rose is just her Achilles heel. And I think, listen, for, for Rose, the best part to get back to the title, she needs Wele to win. And then she'll become champ, and then she'll fight not Wele, and then she'll have to fight Wele, you know? So Carlos Sparza and that split, you know, it's tough, dude. The women's division, straw weight's fun. But if you're a Rose fan, this is best case scenario, because Wele will beat because Wele matches up bad with Carla, right? It's a tough fight for Carla. Carla matches up good with Rose. Rose matches up good with Wele. That's how it goes, man. Anyone can be champs. It just depends how their timing is. So if you're a Rose fan, which I am, I've known that girl forever. Um, we want Wele to win this fight and then call out Rose, and then she's gonna fight Rose. I'm sure she wants that fight, and Rose is her Achilles heel. Let's take a little break, y'all. I'm just chatting your ear off as you're driving into work. Houston, I will see you this Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Houston Improv. Come meet your boy and try that new award-winning Tiger Thick Sweet Nectar at Specs 12 to 2 on Saturday during the day. The whole Thick Boy crew will be there. Come say what's up. Come try the whiskey. Come ask whatever questions you want. I'll be doing a Q&A, all sorts of fun stuff. That's at Specs Downtown Houston. I'll post the exact address on my social media today. Houston, this Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Next week is Milwaukee, Friday, Saturday only. Milwaukee Improv, Province, Rhode Island, December 1st through the 3rd. Those shows are almost sold out. So if we sell out soon, I'll add some shows. But get your tickets, Providence, Rhode Island. You're, I've never been there. Looking forward to it. Then I end the year, the Ohi Thick Tour in Washington, D.C., D.C. Improv, December 15th through the 17th of December. Get your tickets at thickboy.com. This episode of The Shop Show is brought to you by my friends at DraftKings. And guess what? 
UFC 281 is live from New York this freaking Saturday. Get closer to the Octagon with DraftKings Sportsbook, the official sports betting partner of the UFC. Right now, new, cus- new customers can bet $5 on UFC 281 and get $200 in free bets if your fighter wins. Check this out. Right now, everyone can earn up to 100% boost with DraftKings stepped-up parlays. Go to DraftKings Sportsbook app, place a parlay today with three or more picks and combine multiple bets like which fighter will win, total rounds, and so much more. Little parlay, you could take the favorites, you could take Wele, you could take Izzy, you could take Dustin Poirier. The three of them are favorites, but you're not going to make much money betting on the favorites by themselves. So the way to boost your odds Put all three of them together and then do your thing, right? With payouts bigger than ever, DraftKings Sportsbook is where I go to bet on UFC. It's the only place I go because they send my money when I need it. Those have the best odds. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app right now. Use promo code SHOPSHOW, S-C-H-A-U-B, SHOW. Throw down $5 on the... UFC 281 and get $200 in free bets if your fighter wins. That's Code Shop Show this Saturday at DraftKings Sportsbook, the official sports betting part of the UFC. Minimum age eligibility restrictions apply. See show notes for details. DraftKings. Another little break to keep the house lights on and pay the thick boy staff. This holiday season, I'll be giving thanks to our friends over at Manscaped. Everyone loves turkey and stuffing, but you'll be looking like a dessert with the Manscaped's Help Performance Package 4.0. The leaders in below-the-waist grooming have the blessed you with the ultimate Thanksgiving dinner topic. Tell your in-laws about your new cutting-edge ball trimmer and give gift yourself or the man in your life the ultimate men's hygiene bundle trim your pumpkins by going to manscaped.com use code shop 20 s-c-h-a-b 20 for free shipping with 20 percent off the best manscaping products on the planet what else are you going to use i'd love to hear it dude think your holiday spread is good it's time to give thanks to manscaped performance package 4.0 or as i like to call it the perfect package for your package inside you find the lawnmower 4.0 the Weed Whacker Ears Nose Hair Trimmer, Crop Preserver Ball Deodorant, Crop Reviver Toner, Performance Boxers, and a Travel Bag to hold all your goodies. All right, it's fantastic. We got you covered, man. All right, Gifted Manscaped is the ultimate hack to become the family favorite. We got you guys covered. Quit nicking your balls. They bleed like crazy. All right, don't do that anymore. It's 2022. How many times have I told you guys about Manscaped? I swear by them. It's the only thing that touched this face and this wiener. All right, get 20% off and free shipping with the code SHOP. Shop 20, S C H A B 20 at manscaped.com. That's 20 off with free shipping at manscaped.com. Use code SHOP 20. Be thankful this holiday season for the best gift of all from Manscaped. Your balls will thank you. Now let's get back to the program. The main event, you got Izzy Adesanya, Alex Piera. Um, I know everybody's on Piera's giant Brazilian nut sack right now. And I get it. Big, scary guy knocking dudes out. He knocked out Sean Strickland. He had that jumping uh, knee. Me and Eric Griffin broke it down on Fight Night Flashback last week. If you haven't seen it, go watch it because Eric didn't know either of these two. Um, but if you look at Pierre, this is – I'm not sold on Pierre yet. I, you know, I know why the UFC fast-tracked him, and basically they're doing it. It's a byproduct of the way Izzy's been winning. They want to get – they want to stoke a fire under Izzy because remember when Izzy first burst on the scene, he was fun. He was finishing guys. And it's not that he's not fun now, but – in order to get the best out of Izzy, you got to come forward and you got to take chances. And I think now that Izzy's this mythical legend in the middleweight division, guys are very tentative. And so you're getting kind of a boring fight because Izzy's like, I'm not putting my title on the line if your dumbass is just going to sit there. Look at the Yoel Romero fight. He's like, why would I? I'm already the champ, dude. Why am I going to risk all this? Come get it. If you want it, you got to come get it. A lot of these guys aren't willing to risk that because they know they're going to get starched. So. UFC fast track Pierre, which I don't really have an issue with. I think it's short sighted. I'll get to that. But so they fast track Pierre and and gave him the perfect matchups to get to Izzy because if they give him anybody else outside the top seven besides Sean Strickland, they're going to wrestle the shit out of him, and they can't afford that loss because then Pierre definitely doesn't deserve a title shot. He jumps back in the queue. They don't have the narrative between him and Izzy. And obviously the narrative, everybody knows this by now, is Pierre beat him twice in kickboxing. My only issue with that, if you're going to predicate this fight in your decision to bet on Pierre over Izzy off those two kickboxing matches, A, it was kickboxing, not MMA, smaller gloves. B, it was a long time ago. In fight years, it's forever ago. They've both gotten better, but one has gotten better in mixed martial arts, and one has been fighting the best of the best. 
at the highest possible level and being successful for 25 minutes. And his name is not Alex Pierre. Pierre has never fought for 25 minutes in the UFC. Izzy, that's all he knows. He knows how to win. You might say, oh, well, it's boring or it wasn't exciting. doesn't matter. The guy knows how to win at that level. Alex Pierre does it. You're telling me Alex Pierre is going to figure that out for the first time ever in Mass Square Garden in the main event against Izzy? I beg to differ. I don't think he will. Now, can he catch Izzy? Yeah. If this is a video game or going through, you know, their their attributes and their talent and there's, there's a, you know, those weird graph charts and stuff. Pierre has more uh, knockout power than Izzy. I'll give you that. But as far as technique goes, as far as MMA goes, experience, speed, um, you know, kind of uh, the mastery of mixed martial arts, especially when it comes to kickboxing in the UFC, check, check, check. It all goes to Izzy. Izzy checks way more boxes as a mixed martial artist than um, uh, Alex Pierre. The other thing is too, you know, I don't think, I think a lot of people go, well, you tell me Izzy's he's been, you know, training this long in mixed martial arts. You don't know how to wrestle. If he had to, he had to wrestle. He would uh, take Alex down. I don't think that's going to be a big factor in this fight. I know people think uh, Izzy might shoot. I think Izzy, one of the reasons that makes him special is he can figure guys out on the fly. And even though he, you know, it might not be the most exciting thing, he can figure them out, figure out a way to win. I think him, especially not having a wrestling background, knowing Alex Pierre's knees and guys that shoot in, it's a huge risk, and that's not really his bread and butter. I don't see Izzy fighting. I, or, I'm sorry, Izzy wrestling or grappling. I also don't see Izzy um, submitting to that, the narrative that he needs to wrestle to beat him. I think Izzy knows he's more technical and has a speed advantage and has the experience advantage at the uh, main event level, fighting for 25 minutes. So I think you could see Izzy win uh, a decision, like a four-to-one decision, unless Alex Pierre, and he would love this, and but it's not going to happen. Um, Alex Pierre, you know, the way you beat a guy who's more technical than you is you make it a brawl. And Alex Pierre is praying to the Brazilian gods that Izzy has a moment where he goes, I can knock this guy out. I'm just going to let it fly. Because then that favors Alex Pierre, and that's really Alex Pierre's only way to win. Not going to lie to you guys. It's his only way to win. Mm. Is if Izzy goes, fuck all the training, fuck what my coaches say, kind of what Sean Strickland did. When Sean Strickland was on Food Trade, I go, what were you thinking? He's like, the game plan was stand with him a little bit and then shoot in, and I just figured, man, I'm kind of winning this war. You might for a little bit, but the guy hits so goddamn hard, you're playing such a risky game, man, and he suffered a major loss uh, due to that. He's not Izzy. Izzy's one of the well, the thing that makes Izzy special. The same thing that makes John Jones special is the, the the most cerebral fighters in the game. They're the smartest guys we have to offer. So I think for Izzy, and if you go back and watch the fight where he got knocked out, Izzy again s the smarter fighter, uh, more technical. If it was UFC, they would have stopped that fight. They would have stepped in, and stopped the fight. There was a point where you know he he did uh, concuss him and was doing work against them. But then he got into that exchange of power shots. And Alex Pierre loves, you know, he's your Huckleberry. He loves to play that power game. And Izzy decided to play that power game. If you watch an interview with his coach, he goes, I don't know what Izzy's thinking. The whole freaking fight, we told him, don't get into that war with him. Do, you're winning the fight. Do not get in that exchange with Alex Pierre. It's a bad idea. Izzy had a, a you know, an error and a, a mental judgment there and ended up getting knocked out. And now all you guys are buying the narrative that Izzy's just going to get knocked out again. That's fucking stupid. That's assuming Izzy from whatever the fight was five, six years ago is the same fighter. He's definitely not. Izzy is a very cerebral, smart fighter. Has too much to risk to go out there and play Texas shoot him uh, with a freaking guy like Alex Pierre. He's going to sit on the outside, pick him apart. Alex can get frustrated, come in. The only way you get a finish is if Alex were to land something unconventional on Izzy. But really, the only way you're going to get an exciting finish of this fight is if Alex Perry goes, all right, I'm getting destroyed on the outside. I need to start taking some risks. Like a Whitaker, like Apollo Costa, you come in and you get knocked out. Because if Alex Pierre does get frustrated at one point, again, he's never been this level of magnitude of a fight, then if he's embarrassed and his ego gets to him and his coach goes, we, we got to go out on our shield. You're just sitting back there getting picked apart. We're down three rounds. And Alex Pierre goes, fuck it, let's do it. Rushes in, he's going to start him. I, and so 
I, if I had to guess on this, I think that's what happened in the fight. Izzy starts him in the fourth or fifth round due to Alex Pierre in his corner going, we got to go on our shield. You're sitting back, you can pick the part, you're not fast enough. The technique's not there to match with him toe-to-toe. -to -toe. We got to start taking some chances. When you take a chance against Izzy, the reason why he's going to be the best middleweight of all time is because once you take chances, he takes advantage of that, your momentum's coming forward, he's going to knock you out. I, I predict Izzy via knockout late in the rounds, fourth or fifth round. And that's because that Alex is down on the cards and his corner tells him, go out on your shield, and then he gets finished. And then Izzy goes on. Now, the alternate to that, that a lot of you betters out there want to fancy is Alex Pira is just going to do the same thing he did when they fought in kickbox and knock him out. Let's talk about it. Let's say <coughs> if you're an Izzy fan, <coughs> excuse me, don't be mad at my, uh, my uh, Norman cup there. That's right. <laughs> Cool. McDonald. Norm McDonald Cup. So let's talk about why it's so short side to ha uh, for the UFC to press Alex Pierre up in this championship fight. Well, let's say Alex Pierre does what some of you betters think, and Alex Pierre knocks Izzy out. Immediate rematches. He's held the 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 belt too long not to give a guy of his caliber an immediate rematch. He's also now that Nate Diaz is gone, Connor's on yachts, and he's out of the testing protocol. Alex is, I'm sorry, Izzy's also your biggest star. He's your biggest pay-per-view draw internationally and locally. He's big here. He's big everywhere. He connects as far as with the younger crowd, the older crowd. Everyone appreciates Izzy. So, you know, take a guy in Alex Pierre, doesn't speak great English, but looks like a monster. I don't know how many followers he has on Instagram. Not that it matters, but the UFC does put uh, emphasis on that. So you can take a guy in Alex Pierre, you're going to rush him this title shot. He knocks out Izzy. You get an immediate rematch. Let's say for whatever reason, this weird mixed martial arts world that we live in, he ends up knocking Izzy out twice. So he has 500,000 followers. So let's say he ends up knocking out Izzy twice. Well, then what are you going to do? What are you going to do with the guy? Go to the top 10 in the middleweight division, Chin. Mm -hmm. So let's say he just has Izzy's number and Izzy just can't figure him out. So A, you're ruining your biggest pay-per-view star, uh, hands down. So then uh, you give him Robert, Robert Whitaker. Well, Robert Whitaker's background is he was going to be on the Australian national team for wrestling, so he can wrestle. So if anyone can wrestle at a high level, Alex Pierre is fucked, and we know this from earlier in his fights. And he also gets hit from time to time, even at the high caliber uh, striking level that he's at. Again, he's not the most technical guy, but for the UFC standards, he's very high level. He's high level anyway. He's a K1 champion, glory champion. So... You know, to have that pedigree, he's going to be a high-level striker, but he does take chances. He does get hit if you go back and watch the UFC fights. So let's say he beats Izzy twice. He's the champ. He's the face of the middleweight division. Izzy has to go back to jump, go down the queue. So you look at any of the matchups. I would love to hear which matchup he's favored in. Let's go through his options. Robert Whitaker can wrestle, can also strike, has knockout power. Terrible matchup for Alex Pierre. The best matchup possible for Alex Pierre is Izzy because he will only stand with him. And that's saying a lot. Jerry Cannonier, big, can wrestle, beats him. Marvin Vittori, pressure, wrestles, beats him. Derek Brunson, wrestles, good cardio, beats him. Paulo Costa, maybe, because wrestling's not great, would be a fun matchup. Jack Hermanson can grapple his ass off. Darren Till would be a good fight. I, I would imagine if Darren Till wins, when's, when's Till's fight? December 10th, right? I don't know. I'll look. He had that eye injury. Better uh -huh. not fucking pull out. But um, Darren Till's a good matchup for Alex Pierre. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. That's a really good fight for Darren Till. Darren Till, uh, Alex Pierre is a fantastic fight. But again, go you go through those top seven or eight guys. All, all Alex Pierre is an underdog in every single one of those fights. It's very short-sighted. Very short-sighted. But I think the UFC is banking on uh, Izzy getting the win here. They're banking on this stoking the fire to get him out of his as they say, safe uh, kind of mode he's in right now, which I disagree with. I think it's uh, more has to do with the guys that he's fighting. So um, I just think it's short-sighted. I know it, it's a, it's new blood, and this is a fun narrative to talk about, and Alex beat him previously and blah, 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 but I just I don't see it. I would rather Alex walk through some fire to get to uh, Izzy. That's really not how this should work, but here we are. But I think Izzy gets it done. What do you got, Jen? Right here. 
The reason why I went straight into the fights and didn't freaking play grab ass with you guys today is I have three shows today. I got this the shop show, I got Firing the Kid, and then I have a food truck with Aljamain Sterling. And then tomorrow we have Mike Perry food truck. Next week you have Paige. Yep. We're, oh, yeah. we're doing the damn thing. I don't want you to you want to cover any of the fights this weekend, but the one that stands out to me the most is Neil Magny. Neil Magny. Yeah. Yeah, hundred percent. Neil Magny set the record for most wins at welterweight. Mm -hmm. And then he called out um, Gilbert Burns, which I think is a great fight. Did, it, did Burns respond? I'll see. I think he did. And what, did he get uh, uh, Rodriguez with a Darce stroke? Did he get him with a guillotine? Darce. Darce, hell yeah. He was the most underrated guy, one of the most underrated guys in the UFC. Let's see. Yep. Congrats, no man. Also, I heard the UFC said I have an opponent for Brazil. If you don't show up, we can dance. I'm 100 to make this fight happen for now. Great finish and congrats on your record. That's a big deal, dude. I wonder who the opponent is for Gilbert in Brazil. And the UFC could easily switch that opponent. It's Gil, so it has to be a big name. I wonder who it is. That's a fun fight, though, and Neil deserves it. Especially if you can keep it standing. I'll see Jujutsu Neil's Achilles heel at a high, high level. Those guys. You know, he tends to have problems with him. So you said Mazudal verbally agreed before? Jesus Christ. That's a huge That's fight. A big fight. If so you're yeah. Gil, you definitely want to stick with Mazudal, mm -hmm. not Neil Magny. No no disrespect to Neil Magny, but Mazudal, that's a big old Cuban fish on the line. Um. Okay, so during these fights as well, I guess this is the most that it's ever happened that people miss weight for the fights. So it was, it was five people at first, but then one girl eventually cut her hair and made was able to make weight her hair was the yeah. what kind of hair did she have some dreads she some i feel dreads. like dreads are happy i saw some dreads in. oh is it dreads uh, yeah yep yep i've and seen this way too much first 48 it's the dreadlocks gets them every time this homeboy cut like crazy that <laughs> guy looks Nathan like Maness. he came straight out of a concentration camp mm -hmm. that guy is looking tough and he goes on weight on weight <laughs> perfect gonna die on weight yeah. wow five missed it and then they pulled the heavyweight uh fight off with my boy chase sherman because his opponent had some irregular heart do you hear about this no. right before the fight they literally yanked it the uh, right after wayne's hit something with his heart that sucks so really six people didn't fight but the, i'm sorry six missed weight five missed weight but five missed one... weight then one had a heart issue oh yeah it's, so you're saying just fights that didn't yeah place. man six fights had some issues five of those was because of weight one cut their dreads the dreads look heavy mm -hmm. they just like smelly they look stinky i don't <laughs> they look stinky on house of dragons there's a lot of dreads a lot of dreads like all bullshit you have to put like wax in your hair to get those dreads and not wash it yeah so your hair smells like hummus that's got to be dreads right that's dreads 100 okay. yeah 100 percent. that's dreads Jen. yeah it's a um, white girl with dreads, huh? Mm hmm Fuck yeah. Interesting. This is not a big deal, but we'll just go watch a quick video. This is um, Bare Knuckle, BKFC over the weekend. I guess one guy got uh, disqualified, and there was a bit of a brawl, and the guy, the main guy from uh, BKFC, the president, yeah. he got involved too. So I'll just Hit it. Why did he get disqualified? <laughs> oh. And where's the uh, oh there you, oh yeah you can't have that stuff damn did that uh, president take him down yeah so I'll just show you the he shot a double <laughs> here's a slow motion of it oh no he just fell back he didn't yeah. take it down and then he fell down on top of him he just wanted to stop it because especially your bare knuckle this is what people want right this meaning like people like yeah bare knuckle these guys are barbarians look at him just fighting so uh -huh. that's the last thing he wants if you have sponsors and endorsement deals last thing you want this episode of the shop show is brought to you by better help 
Sometimes I wish life came with a manual. I really do. I wish it came to a manual. Like, hey, if you're going to make this decision, you should need help with this. You need to do this. All right. But unfortunately, life doesn't come with a user manual. It just doesn't. So when it's not working for you and you're getting your way and your normal life, you feel stuck. Navigating any life's challenges can make you feel unsure with career change, a new relationship, becoming a parent, whatever it is. There's a lot going on in the world. And thank God for my friends at BetterHelp. BetterHelp has connected over 3 million people with licensed therapists, not your friends not your family we're talking about professional licensed therapists it's convenient it's accessible anywhere it's 100 online 100 online all right and i use better help i sometimes i've had to switch my therapist maybe i'm just not feeling one or maybe they're great but it's not a fit for me it's so easy to change i've done it a few times myself all right so uh as the world's largest therapy service better help has matched three million people with professionally licensed vetted therapists available 100 online plus it's affordable just fill out a brief questionnaire to match with a therapist if things are clicking like i told you guys you can easily switch to a new therapist anytime you want couldn't be easier no waiting rooms no traffic no endless searching for the right therapist we got you man learn more and save 10 percent off your first month at betterhelp.com slash s-c-h-a-u-b that's betterhelp h-e-l-p.com slash shop after years of fine print contracting and ripped off by big wireless providers which we've all been there if we've learned anything it's that there's always a catch so when i first heard that mint mobile offers premium wireless starting at just 15 bucks a month and I was like, oh, I see Ryan Reynolds on the commercial commercials. Ryan Reynolds is a smart guy. What's he know? I thought there has to be a catch. But after talking to them and using their service, it all made sense. There isn't one. I was doing it. I was in Canada at my Mint Mobile. Mint Mobile's secret sauce is that they're the first company to sell wireless service online only. Cuts out the middleman. They cut out the cost of retail stores and pass those sweet, sweet savings directly to you. All right. These other services, there's always a catch. It's impossible to get out of. There's some fine print. You don't want to deal with any of that. Let the people that are giving back to the people help you out at Mint Mobile. For anyone who hates their phone bill, Mint Mobile offers premium wireless for just 15 bucks a month. Mint Mobile gives you the best rate whether you're buying for one or the entire family. And at Mint, family start two lines. You two lines, man. All plans come with unlimited talk and text, high-speed data delivered on nation's largest 5G network. Use your own phone with any Mint Mobile plan and keep your same phone number along with all your contacts so it's not a whole hassle. Switch to Mint Mobile and get premium wireless starting at 15 bucks a month. To get your new wireless plan for 15 bucks a month and get the plan shipped to your door for free, go to mintmobile.com slash shop. That's Mint Mobile, M-I-N-T, mobile.com slash S-C-H-A-B. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash shop. This episode of the Shop Show is also brought to you by the best nootropics on the planet. Nootropics are so hot right now. You're like, yeah, I don't know which ones to use. What do I do? We'll use the one that you've probably heard about. You heard your friends talk about. You heard your coworkers talking about. You're driving to work. You're like, man, I wish my brain was more fired up. I wish I could form better sentences like Joe Rogan. I listen to his podcast all the time. Wish I could talk to him. Wish I could talk like him. Well, I'm here to let you in on a little secret. Joe Rogan swears by uh, on its alpha brain, the best nootropic on the planet. Gets you in that flow state, helps you focus on the task at hand. It's caffeine free. Here's how confident on it is in the nootropic alpha brain. They're so confident, money back guaranteed. Oh, you don't like it? You don't like talking like Joe Rogan or Elon Musk? Cool, man. Send us, you get your money back. You don't have to send it back. Go ahead and keep the bottle. Do what you want with it. Give it to your friends who are going to appreciate it. Don't devalue on it. How dare you? You can keep the bottle and then maybe you come around and then we don't have to worry about it. But you can save 10% off by going to onit.com slash shop, S C H A B. You get 10% off not only on it, uh, Alpha Brain, but you also get 10% off everything on that site protein bars, warrior bars, protein powder, creatine, fish oil, multivitamins, workout gear, steel club maces, kettlebells. Whatever you want, battle rope, battle ropes, we got it all, man. Onit.com slash shop, 10% off. Or you can pick up Alpha Brain at your local Walmart, or you can help your boy out. Avoid going to Walmart and help me out. It's a win-win. Onit.com slash shop, 10% off the entire site, especially Alpha Brain. Now for reals. Let's get back to the program, Jin. Uh, you know what wild thing you can see in uh, Multiple knuckle? headbutts. That's the reason why he was disqualified. And he kept headbutt butting him? <laughs> I guess so. Well, yeah, it's frowned upon. Good for him for doing that nice little takedown. Mm -hmm. 
All right, so this was. Ooh, a- this is interesting. Yeah, yeah. My, my boy Nick Davis, who's the ultimate better, got wind of this early on, and he goes, "Hey, man, I'm sure you're covering uh, the the Derek uh, Minor fight, mm-hmm. Minor fight stuff." It. And I go, uh, "What's going on with it?" So me and Nick chatted about it. So if you haven't heard yet, so uh, during UFC uh, Vegas 64 this past weekend, Derek Minor. Fell to Jesus Christ. I know. This name is Shailan tough. We're going to call him Shay Shay. He fell to Shay Shay. Derek Shailan. Minor fell to Shay Shay. First round technical knockout. And the hours lead this where it gets interesting. So get your mind right if you're listening, driving to work right now. And the hours leading up to the fight, sports books watched as a flood of money came in from betters on Shay Shay. <laughs> and not just the money line on Shay Shay, but the Chinese import to win in fewer than two and a half rounds. So that means not only were they betting on Shay Shay, they're betting that he's going to get a finish under two and a half rounds. Mm. So even Shay Shay to win by knockout in the first round, right? Um, so much action came in on Shay Shay, AK Wolverine, that he moved from a minus 220 favorite to minus 420 favorite. So just so you guys know, the way this works is whenever the money line moves big time on better, there's a commission out there. That goes, hmm, we should look into this. Because this this isn't like a high-level fight, right? I, mean, I shouldn't say I made a mistake I know there. what you're saying. Let though. me back up. This isn't a... Big name? It, this isn't a high-magnitude fight. This isn't a two famous fighters. So when a random guy named Shea Shea Wolverine goes from a minus 20 to a minus 420 favorite, literally an hour before the fight... Then the legal investigation team of betting goes, something's going on here. This isn't right. So uh, that alerts these investigators uh, into betting to open an investigation to see what's going on here. I'll tell you what I think happened, but I'll tell you about the rumor mill. Hmm. So keep going, Chin. So um, our goal is always is to notify the industry of any potential uh, abnormal or suspicious activity as soon as possible so they can take action as quickly as possible. The U.S. Integrity President Matthew Holt says to ESPN, in this case, we hope that by sending a couple, we hope by, we hope that by sending a couple hours before the fight started, we may have helped prevent some more sus- suspicious bets from getting through. Mm-hmm. While it looks like Miner's injury uh, leaked from his camp and the hours leading up to the fight, there's added complication that the Nebraskan coach by James Cruz, Krause, Krause. who shot to James Krause, mm-hmm. fantastic coach. The same James Krause who runs a betting pick <laughs> service complete with a podcast. I think it's called 1%. Shout out to his podcast, 1%. Uh, Discord server for paying members. In the past, he said that he makes more money from gambling on UFC than he ever did fighting. And then remember that little thing that came out with the UFC saying that if you are a fighter or your team member or whatever, you can't bet on fights. So for him, a coach. Well, um, he said he could. If you look well, he's retired, exchange. but he's a coach. Yeah, he's a coach. Yeah, that's like Dusty Baker betting on Houston Astros. I don't even the biggest Astros fan. I'm just in Houston this weekend, so come see me Thursday, Friday, Saturday. I'm actually a Phillies fan. Yeah, I like uh, Bryce Harper, but they lost, and Houston cheats all the time. But still, see you soon, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Houston. Uh, so this is at Man of the Library, but James Krause is still actively bet on fights and bragging about it. He's also bet on bouts involving fighters that he coaches. That's where it gets dicey. Yeah. He asked people for their accounts to make bets and manipulate markets with one hundred percent win guarantee. How can one guarantee one hundred percent win in the UFC? And then James Krause says, "None at all. I'm not a UFC fighter anymore." And then uh, this guy Beast like one one nine shout out to Beast like one one nine. Well, I know you're retired, but wasn't sure if they were going to come at the teams too. But then again, I don't know how they can even do that. But great news. And then James Krause, but nah, we good. Yeah. You know, I said nah, we good. I like. Urban it up a little there for you guys. He just put, nope, we're all good. Um, ew, that's dicey being a coach bet on the fights. Mm. And this guy put, I am in his paid gambling group, and I don't feel like any, if anything like what you described is happening. He gives out his picks usually later on Friday afternoon, and that's it. I don't think there's any pumping or dumping going on. Anywho, um, yeah, this is what I think is going on. I think, uh, yes, James Krause is a head coach of a very successful team and obviously makes a lot of money giving picks and betting because he's a great expert when it comes to UFC and mixed martial arts, so he's probably somebody you should listen to. Um, I would probably not bet on the guys that are from his camp, right, because obviously he's going to be a little biased there. 
And I would assume, too, he never picks against his fighters. Can you imagine if he was fighting? You're like, what the? F- Dude, you said I was going to lose in under <laughs> two and a half rounds? What the fuck? Yeah. You know, so that gets a little dicey. That, that gets a little cloudy judgment there. Um, but I, what I think happened is uh, Kraus knew that um, Minor had a pretty bad injury. Mm. And this is where, where this gray area, I don't think it's that gray. I think it's kind of poor taste to leak the news that the guy has a knee injury that's straight in your camp and to tell others to bet on his opponent, Shay Shay the Wolverine. Uh, I don't think anything illegal happened here, right? Yeah, but that's still a guess. Too, it's huh? a gray year. It's very gray. It's gray. When I say gray, I mean it's dark, right? <laughs> it's dark, dark gray, dark gray matter here. Um, if I'm uh, the Cruz, I would probably stay away from that one. Um, you know, yeah. What do you think? And listen, James Cruz is a great guy too. That's the other thing. If he's like a sleaze bag, I'm like, oh, this is some bullshit. But he's a really good dude, and he's a great coach. Got, knows his picks, making a living more, makes more money off picking bets and betting on fighters than he does coaching and fighting the UFC. Do you have a problem with it, Chin? I can see how people do. I don't know what really happened though, so I don't know. So let me ask this, Chin. So would you have a problem if Dusty Baker, right? He's the old, I think he's 74, oldest coach to ever win a World Series. He's He, he had like 2,000 something wins before he won a World Series as a manager. He takes over Houston, who's notoriously known for cheating, right? Got busted, whatever. Still a goddamn good team, and I don't think they cheated this one, but it's fun to talk about it. So let's say Dusty Baker, the manager, right? So Dusty Baker would be the same things as James Cruz, Kraus, right? And Kraus. So Dusty Baker, would you have any issue if Dusty Baker, uh, he knew, let's say, uh, uh, his star pitcher was injured, and you found out Dusty Baker was telling people to bet on the Philadelphia <laughs> Phillies? If he if he knew and he was actually betting against the guy because he was injured, then I would say that's pretty shady. Now I, I'm going to give James Krause, uh a bit of a, a you know Lee share on this, where I think he probably told some of his close friends, right? Uh, loose lips sink ships. Mm-hmm. He probably told a couple of close friends, "Hey, Miner's knees way worse than we thought, and so bet on the other guy." Probably told some of his close friends. Loose lips sink ships, and his close friends started, you know, telling other people. And you know how much money would have to go on that money line to actually change from minus two twenty to four twenty. Yeah, so a ton of people. Would so a ton of people got in on, or, or some jackass got on line on whatever site he's on or on his social media, and then it really gets traction. Mm-hmm. So I don't think like James Krause was like, "Hey, everybody, miners' leg super fucked up." Bet against the other guy. That's my pick of the week. Like that would be ridiculous. Of course, yeah. of course he's not that stupid. He's he's a good dude. Mm-hmm. Great coach too. So I think he told a few close friends, and then this and then this happens. You know, it's awesome. definitely gray. It's a gray area. I don't know what the UFC is going to do because if you tell James Krause you can't bet on the fights for your coach guys, can it it, it it's a gray area because if I'm James Krause, go. Cool. I just won't corner guys anymore. You can't say I can't coach them, or they can just say I'll still coach them like I always do. They'll put somebody else down on paper as their head coach. I'm still going to help them game plan stuff like that and train out my gym, and, and I'm still going to bet. So I'm James Cross. I'm making that much money off betting. Mm-hmm. I'm not just going to give that up. Yeah, but I'm like, just- I'm like, prove it. Yeah, I help them get ready for fights. I'm not their head coach. Put that in the contract. He could just tell his buddies to bet for him. Simple as that. No, they're not going to be able to track that. We can't tell your buddies to bet. Well, he could say, all right, I'm done betting, but I. Can, but they can't say you can't even recommend, right? I mean, just don't tell anyone. and just. I mean, don't tell any of the authorities, but you tell your buddies, hey, bet on this, and then you guys get. Yeah, but you're not going to make money doing that. So he has to still keep his show 1%, right? So he can say, all right, uh, UFC notified oh, me. About I'm actually out. Uh, I'm, I'm no longer personally betting on the fights. Although I'm sure maybe he has a profile like whatever, you know, rank D, you know, fucking dreadlock boy or whatever he wants to go by. He can still bet under that weird anonymous account, but he can't officially bet. It's not like the UFC can put an umbrella and go, if you train in the gym with a professional fighter, you can't bet. If you train with anybody and they're in the UFC and you help them out in any capacity, you can't bet on fights. There's no way. You can't do the umbrella. 
How far is that going to go? Then nobody in the gym can bet anymore? Yeah. There's no way. So James Grass, it, listen, it's gray. It's murky. I don't think he did anything bad here. I think he told a few couple dumb friends who blasted out. Now he's in this situation, and now they're risking his business. But he should be able to be smart, be able to maneuver around this. He's still a good dude. Great guy. Listen to his picks, not mine. All right. Did you know Mark Hunt fought over the weekend? I Boxing? sure did. I sent to Rogan. <laughs> I said, dude, he's 40. How old is he? 48. 40, 48. His opponent is 37 undefeated. 37 undefeated. It's not like he fought some bum. Mm -hmm. And, dude, he lights this dude up. Yeah. The highlight is fantastic. Oops. Great body shot. That The body shot hurt him. And remember, this is boxing, kids. And this guy was light lighting him up too. That guy's jacked. Mm -hmm. They got, he looks like if you if you're only watching this as he's driving to work, he looks like Anthony Joshua, but from New Zealand. <laughs> Imagine Anthony Joshua, but if he grew up surfing and killing fish. Rocks him there. The guy's rocked. Boom, 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 boom. That's Mark Hunt, Daddy. Yeah, it's super cool to see. At 48. You know, I was supposed to fight Mark Hunt after he fought Bigfoot Silver. Remember that? I think Bigfoot or someone, uh, not Mark, but I think Bigfoot tested positive. But it was, it's regarded before that kind of black eye on that fight where Bigfoot tested positive. It was regarded as like the best heavyweight fight of all time. Roots of Fight made shirts, greatest heavyweight fight of all time. But then that came out so they had to pull the shirts, I think. So if you got one, hang on yeah. to it. And then after that fight, I was on a win streak. I forget how it was, but me and Mark uh, Hunt started talking shit to each other on Twitter. And then he DM'd me, he goes, you really want to do this? I said, I'm down, man. I was like, I'm just going to take this fucking behemoth down and try and finish him, which is easier said than done. Mm -hmm. But um, going back and forth, then the UFC sent me a contract for somebody else. I go, well, no. I, I was texting Dana. I go, no, me and Mark literally agreed to fight. And to Dana's defense, he goes, that's not really how it works. You guys don't create your own fights, and we just put the contracts together. I was like, yeah, I, I know, but he said he would fight me. He goes, cool, dude. We don't give a fuck. <laughs> We have somebody else in mind for you. I'm like, all right, that makes sense. I'm an idiot. I also do that with Verdum, too. Me and Verdum were supposed to fight. We agreed to fight. He was like, I'll fight you. And I'll fight you on the moon. I was like, oh, that's a terrible <laughs> matchup for me. Yeah, Verdum was legit. Oh, my God. Yeah. No, I, I, he's better at everything. <laughs> it was such a nightmare. That's how, you know, that's how fucking uh, when you're a fighter, man, you got this weird arrogance about you. That was a nightmare. Wow. Thank God the UFC was like, What? No, bitch. You're fighting somebody else. Cool. That would have been cool to see you and Hunt, though. Like, honestly. I, <laughs> I, I wanted to fight. But me and Hunt were, like, talking shit to each other. On, uh, I was making fun of, like, his cardio and how slow he was. And I was like, I'm just going to take you down and rip your fucking neck off. You know, just whatever bullshit. But on DMs, like, hey, man, huge fan here. <laughs> you know, it'd be an honor to fight. He's like, I get it, boss. I get it, man. He's like, we got to sell the fight. He's like, I'm down. Tell UFC to sign the contract. I'm like, you tell him. He's like, I don't talk to him. And he's always, you know, he has the Mark Hunt's fight as, and the UFC needs to be careful because as, you know, badass of, as Mark Hunt is, and you're talking, dude, Mark Hunt, you're talking about like a real OG, like as tough as they mm -hmm. get, probably top five toughest guys to ever enter the, a real, I know everyone say, get, you know, Hamza gangster, Nate Diaz gangster, shut the fuck up. Mark Hunt is a legit hard nosed gangster. When it comes to fighting, not, I'm not talking about illegally and that the dark arts and the mafia and trafficking. No, no, drug trafficking, you know, and shaking people down. I'm just talking about when you talk about gangster, Mark Hunt is your poster boy. There's nobody tougher than Mark fucking Hunt. When Mark Hunt has a mission, he's going to get it done. Mark Hunt's mission is to fight the UFC because remember, he opened up that lawsuit against the UFC and I think it's still ongoing. I know he's taking some L's because again, this is a money thing. So the UFC is this powerhouse. They're never going to run out of money. So they're going to fight this to the day they die. But Mark Hunt is putting up the good fight. Because remember, the UFC had Mark Hunt fight Brock Lesnar, knowing Brock Lesnar was on extra sauce and allowed that fight to carry on. No, knowing damn well, Mark, uh, I'm sorry, Brock Lesnar was on sauce. So that's Mark Hunt's argument, right? Yeah. But I'm, the UFC, anybody out there, you, we're too loosey goosey with the term gangster. Hamza gangster, Nate Diaz gangster. Nobody, and I know Nate Diaz has all those great quotes, and it's it's fun to do and stuff like that. And Conor McGregor and his ties to that stuff. 
when I tell you nobody is more, if I had to have somebody in my foxhole, you need to listen to all those guys. Mark Hunt would be my first choice. The only problem is it's going to be a tight fit in that foxhole <laughs> with me and him in there. It's going to be two thickies in that foxhole. Mark Hunt is a massive man. Mark Hunt is top five toughest human beings to ever exist in combat sports. And he just saw what he did against an undefeated boxer. He still has it. You know? So his his chip on his shoulder with the UFC, the UFC is messing with a different quote unquote gangster. It's not the guy you want to upset, man. He's a real one. Legend. Straight up fucking legend. From the Pride Days, K1, I mean, dude, scary mother trucker, man. Yeah. His comeback in the UFC was insane. It was awesome. Remember he he was losing. Uh, he remember he came over the UFC and it was rough. He came. Out, hold on, let me see if uh, if if I have CT or not. He came over the UFC. Remember he got uh, key locked by Mitrione's boy. He got key locked early on. I forget the guy's name. You know that guy? Go to Mark Hunt's mm-hmm. record. Funny guy too. Remember uh, Mitch, He's friends with Mitrione and Josh Barnett. I can't remember his name right now. Sean McCorkle. Oh, that dude. Okay. Remember Sean yeah, McCorkle? Yeah, yeah. Super tall guy, big guy. Dude, how about this? He lost by a straight arm bar to Gay Guard Musasi. I know, that's insane. Super Hulk Grand Prix and Dream in freaking Japan, dude. Ooh, he had a tough stretch. <laughs> so he lost to Josh Barnett. So, th- But this is my thing. You know, I, I, I think at the time I was like a high-level brown belt, right? I was feeding myself in jiu-jitsu. I was submitting guys, submitting Mitrione. was open for Mark Hunt. Um remember so they give him josh barnett and pride oh the pride days dude this is the yeah. open weight grand prix uh, quarterfinal josh josh barnett beats him uh, via kimura then he gets fedor for the pride heavyweight championship he gets fedor fedor eight minutes in the first round another first round was 10 minutes mm-hmm. right was it 10 or 15 minutes 10, 10, 10 yeah. yeah so uh this is 2006 pride crucial countdown literally i think the golden age of fighting there's nothing better man than those pride days with mm-hmm. those fucking foreign superstars all sauced up so it's mark hunt and remember mark hunt's never been never touched a needle hates needles was clean this entire time one of the only guys ever clean throughout pride one of the only guys clean now when i go over this record there's not one guy on there that i'm gonna go over uh, over his dream record that i could say was actually clean maybe gegard musasi outside that ready for this Love the guy. Lost to Josh Barnett. Josh Barnett's been busted several mm-hmm. times for PDs. He was submitted by him uh, via Kimura. Then Fedor goes, oh, you have problems with Kimura? Now, also, to Mark Hunt's defense, he only has going into that Josh, but he's fighting Josh Barnett, the who's who. Now, going into that fight, he only has seven mixed martial arts fights. His third fight ever was against a guy, maybe you've heard of him, Vanderlei Silva. His third fight ever in mixed martial arts was against Vanderlei Silva in Pride. He won that split decision over Vanderlei Silva. Then they go, cool story, dude. Here's Mirko Krokop. Now, this isn't the Mirko Krokop Brendan knocked out in the third round in New, in New Jersey. This is 2005. Tip of the spear, Mirko Krokop. And Mark Hunt has, ready for this, four fights at the time. He beats him via split decision. So, I, dude, I don't know, and I'm so glad we stumbled upon this. I don't know if there's anybody with four fights, and in their four fights, their third fight was Vanderlei Silva, and their fucking fourth fight was Mirko Krokop. Insane, dude. Nutsos, right? So he beats him. He goes uh, in pride. He wins one, two, three, four, five in a row. Then you go, okay, cool story. Here's the Pride Open Weight Grand Prix, which those open weights were so much fucking fun, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, Shogun won one. Remember that? They're fantastic. Yeah. It's just, that's real fighting at the highest level. Those days, the shoot boxing days, the the Hammer House gym, all that shit. Oh, I love that stuff. Yeah. It's like uh, uh, when bodybuilding had Arnold Schwarzenegger and all those dudes, and they're at Gold's doing the thing, hanging out with their shirts off and short shorts and just, about fighting money chicks the real wild west days mm-hmm. so he gets v- vandalay silva with the he only has three fights murko crop crow cop is his fourth fight vintage vandalay vintage murko he wins four in a row i'm sorry five in a row in pride 
Then they go, cool story. Now we're going to throw you to the big boys. Josh Barnett gets submitted first round. Fedor submitted, same thing, Camaro first round. Uh, then he fights Alistair Overeem. Now, I'd love to hear which one of these guys is clean, by the way, as we're so going far. through this. All right? Now, remember, Vendelay Merck. Oh, okay. Josh Barnett. Okay. Fedor, teach their own. I know his body doesn't look like much, but a gun to the head, I'd probably say he's on things. Fedor in 2006, vintage Fedor. Loses him via Camara, and then he gets Alistair Overeem. Alistair Overeem, although mainly people know him as a, uh, you know elite striker, the boy can grapple his ass off. He wins key lock. So he gets camara and then he gets key lock. Clearly has an issue with jiu-jitsu. Mm-hmm. And then they give him Melvin Manouf, Dynamite Pride 2008. And he gets, uh, he gets knocked out in 18 seconds. That's how much of a badass Melvin Manhoof was. And then the Pride guys go, oh, man, that's a shame. Uh, you lost to Josh Barnett, Fedor, Alistair Overeem, and Melvin. And then uh, I'm sure Mark was like, can I get a drug test? They go, shut your mouth. And then here's, and now his record gets a little salty because he's five and five after the Melvin knockout. And then he, they fight Gegard Musasi. And Gegard goes, uh, you struggle with jiu-jitsu, check out this straight arm bar. And Gegard Musasi arm bars Mark Hunt, who has two fire hydrants for arms. Not long, very strong. He gets submitted in Dream 9 in the first round. All these finishes by submissions are in the first round, right off the bat, besides the knockout over Melvin. Then the UFC acquires Pride, right? They get uh, Mark Hunt, who they weren't crazy about, but they had to take him on because he's still out of contract. They give him Sean McCorkle, Sean McCorkle in the first round, again, straight arm bar. I always thought it was a key lock. I don't know why I'm thinking arm bar. I don't know. That's strange. But then uh, Mark's on the verge of getting cut. They give him Chris Tushisher. Now, this is where me and um, Mark Hunt have similar opponents because I also fought Chris Tushisher uh, around that time. I think uh, quite a bit after this. So his record's five and seven going to the Chris Tusher fight. The UFC's going to cut him. They give him Chris Tusher, sure. If you don't know Chris Tusher, he wrestled at North Dakota, I think. He was the best friends and main training partners with Brock Lesnar. Real savage. First team, all ugly. This dude's grill. He looked like a bad guy from every James Bond movie you've ever seen. His just When God was giving out looks, he was dead last in line. His teeth are a fucking tragedy. His teeth look like a Japanese Japan city skyline. It is a mess. When God was doing his teeth, he went. He took a break. And went, well, hold on, what'd you say? Let me get back to this, and then just skipped a few teeth. Look at him. He does look like a villain. He look, don't he look like a bad yeah. guy? The nicest guy though. Yeah. The nice guy. And his record was nutsos going to the UFC. Nutsos. Hmm. I think his record was like twenty and two. Something stupid. I did not want to fight that guy, but I ended up fighting him. <laughs> Um, so they give Mark Hunt, Chris Tusher, Mark Hunt knocks him fucking silly in his home in Australia, right? That's in his backyard. Then they give him Ben Rothwell. Now what happens about this? I did not know we're going to do this Mark Hunt deep dive, but I, I'm here for it. He fights Ben Rothwell. His record six and seven. He fights Ben Rothwell at UFC 135 at the Pepsi Center in Denver, Colorado. Oh, it, it might have been at Broomfield events that I had most of my uh, fights before I got in the UFC. So Broomfield, they do the UFCs there. So they put Ben Rothwell, veteran, versus Mark Hunt, veteran. The UFC refuses to do heavyweight fights at a high altitude, especially in Denver, Colorado. They said, we will never do a heavyweight fight again in Denver, Colorado due to the altitude because of Ben Rothwell and Mark Hunt. They just, you know, it was like, we thought it was going to be gangbusters. It's one of the worst fights you've ever Slowly. seen. So he somehow edged out a victory over Ben Rothwell. So he's won two now. He can't hold the, the, the high altitude Denver fight against them, even though I had no issues with it. Well, not a big deal. He's, the, these guys are better than me. So then they give him Czech Congo, two strikers. This is in Japan. Big boy fight. He knocks out Czech Congo. And then what I think is the most disrespectful knockout of all time Stefan Struve, because he's seven foot, when he gets knocked out, it just looks bad. Like, if you're a hunter, you see a hunter shoot a deer, it's whatever. You see a a hunter even shoot an elephant because they have low leverage to the ground, it's whatever. When you see a hunter shoot a giraffe, there's something so 
disrespectful because the giraffe's <laughs> neck and everything, it all comes down like Twin Towers. It's just a nightmare. So he knocks out Struve nightmare. The him Junior Dos Santos, shout out to Junior Dos Santos, spinning uh, hook kick was ridiculous, fight of the night, right? Mm -hmm. And then he gets Bigfoot Silva, Antonio Silva, in 2013. It was fight of the night in Australia. It goes to a, a draw. It turned out to be a draw. Mm -hmm. A lot of people think that it is the greatest heavyweight fight yeah. of all time. But then slowly as a fight, you know, aged like fine wine, you find out Silva result was changed to no contest due to a failed post drug fight uh, drug test. So while Hunt's remained a majority draw. So really this should go to Hunt. Then they give him Roy Nelson, who has the greatest uh, chin of all time. I know from experience, he's tough to put away. Roy Nelson uh, gets knocked out with an uppercut and it's knocked out of the year. When's knocked out of the year in 2014. That's vintage Roy Nelson, man. And after that, it gets a little dicey for him. He gets Fabricio Verdum, and that was in Mexico City, remember? Um, and Mexico City, again, high altitude. I don't know why they keep on my boy Mark Hunt in high altitude. Mexico City is so fucking high. He gets Verdum there. That's a fantastic fight. Then they give him Stipe. He loses to Stipe. That's when Stipe starts off on his fucking tangent and uh, becomes world champion. Then they give him Antonio Silva. Um, yeah, they give him Bigfoot Silva. Again, and Bigfoot Silva uh, gets knocked out this time. So that ends that. And then he fights our boy Frank Mir, mm -hmm. which is uh, not nice. And he knocks Mir out. So he's on, you know, his legend is building. Then they give him Brock Lesnar, UFC 200, one of the biggest UFCs of all time. It was originally a unanimous decision win for Brock Lesnar. He really just wrestled him in that fight, refused to stand with him. He was terrified. You've never seen a dude as big as Brock Lesnar more terrified to engage in a fight than his fight against Mark Hunt. Boring fight, UFC 200, huge disappointment. You had, uh, you had Anderson DC on the fight. Remember that? Because Jones was supposed to be on it, but but uh, fell out. Remember that? Yeah. So you had uh, Amanda Nunes, you had uh, Misha Tate, Lesnar Hunt, Cormier, Silva, Aldo, Frank Edgar, too. Mm -hmm. Ridiculous card. Remember they had that weird orange mat that looked like shit? Uh, so poor, um, poor Mark Hunt. That's why he has his lawsuit with the UFC. They knew the, that Brock Lesnar was just juiced to the gills and allowed him to fight uh, the legend Mark Hunt, and he hates that. And then the UFC goes, okay, cool. Here's uh, Alistair over. Alistair knocks out with a vicious fucking knee. Then remember they give him Derek Lewis, which we thought was gonna be a great fight. He knocks him out in the fourth round. That's in New Zealand. Here's the thing: you don't want to fight Mark Hunt. In anywhere near Australia, New Zealand, Australia, you got to find him at high altitude for God's sakes. Then after that, it gets dicey. They give him Curtis Blades, awful matchup for him. Alex o Olenek, awful matchup for him. And then Justin Willis was his last one. Deep dive on the yeah. gangster Mark Hunt. That was shout, cool. Shout out to Mark Hunt. That was fun. I remember they wanted to pay him to leave. He's like, no, he's in fight out his contract. And then he. Started killing it. Few guys, yeah. Same thing when the the UFC acquired Strike Force, they got a lot of their fighters because their contracts they had to obey to, mm -hmm. even though they took over the the identity that was you know Strike Force. And when they took over Pride, because you know Monopoly, right? It's Monopoly, and so they would just acquire Pride, which I think was a huge mistake. They should have left Pride where it's at and just build it professionally, like they did in the UFC, and they'd have a massive draw over there. Because remember, I mean. In in Australia, the you know uh, Whitaker Adesanya is the biggest gate of all time, so they still have some of those big shows showcases like that. But dude, when you're talking about the Tokyo Superdome, when, when they're fighting Japan, when the in Ch and they're trying in China now, it, it's so short sighted. Where if they would have left Pride, and because the the Asian market knew Pride. They love Pride. Mm -hmm. The American market loved Pride. The hardcore still swear by it. You say Pride is dead, you might get shot, dude. That's why I get so much hate. I fought Pride guys. I fought Noguera. I fought Crow Cop. I knocked out Crow, Crow Cop. Then Noguera got me. Your boy's one and one. All right? One and one against Pride. Pride is dead. Pride died when the UFC fucking took it over. Not because of me. Pride died when the UFC took them and then did their thing. But, yeah, Mark Hunt, the point of this entire rant is that Mar you guys are too loose with the term gangster. Mark Hunt's a real gangster. Yeah. And you guys should fucking bow to his feet. <laughs> he fought everybody. Everybody. And he helps guys out too now. Mm-hmm. Um, alrighty. So this is a 
random deep dive on Mark Hunt, huh? Yeah. You guys weren't ready for that. The I prior days, was, I remember the prior days when you watched those, I think it was VHS at that time, but when you see the shows, they look like amazing productions. The huge. closest thing we have to is one championship. Now, the person that uh, does the production for Pride is the head producer for one championship. Ah. That's why I see a lot of common themes there. As far as like production goes and like experience, Pride was the best of all time. The UFC still not there. I mean, when Izzy walks out or there's something, it's still great. Or when Connor did, it was right there. But as far as doing it for every fight, night after night, one championship is the closest thing we'd have to Pride. Mm. I went to Pride when uh, Fedor fought uh, uh, Mark Coleman. Yeah, and actual? I went. I was front row. What you can see me on some of the uh, highlights when they shit, because my buddy uh, Joe Klopfenstein just he was new new oh you rich rich and he had that new money because he's drafting the uh, he was the first pick in the second round for the rams me and him were obsessed with pride and so he bought uh front row tickets that they were 600 bucks at that time was all the money in the world i remember me and him bought suits and sat in the front row and we looked like two assholes <laughs> everybody else was in like tap out affliction shirts and wearing two suits in the front row and we're right uh we're ringside because remember they found a ring in pride and we we're right where they'd walk walk out, and we'd try to get, we I bought, we bought I forget what merch I bought I think I bought a Fedor shirt but it would go like this. You think Travis Scott's merch hard to get? Pride back in the day, vintage Pride when they first came is the first fight ever in America, first and last fight in America. That merch, bro, you would have thought it was that Diana uh, Princess Diana uh, pink beanie baby. That shit, the lines to get it, people were fighting each other. Mm. I, I think I bought like a medium shirt just to get my hands on it. Yeah. Those were the days. Yeah. If the UFC wasn't so short sighted, man, leave Pride, leave the brand of Pride out there. They do a super fight, Pride versus UFC. You still have the Asia market. What mm -hmm. do I know, though? Yeah, they're going to talk. Okay, so. Speaking of Pride, you have Anna Silva. Remember, Anna Silva, Pride guy. Yeah, and then. Uh, and wanted to retire, and Big Nog talked him out of it. Do you remember Real Chonin? Too high, yeah. He, he he did that flying arm bar on Silva. That was pretty yeah, crazy bro. pride. Yeah. Um, all right. So Jake Paul was on Logan Paul's po podcast, Impulsive, and he was talking about how he feels the numbers weren't as good as they should have been because of, he has a theory about this. He made some great points. You know, you can say what you want about Jake Paul, but when it comes to selling fights and ticket sales and then also fighter pays, not much can hate on about. But this makes all the sense, and I agree with him in so many uh reasons here he makes some great points so he goes the pre-buys were going crazy um up up and up and on wednesday when the news came out uh, about anderson saying that he got knocked out or whatever so remember he's referring to anderson in the pre-fight uh some interview uh no it was a uh, it was the pre-fight um press conference press conference so in the press conference they were are you ready for this fight and so goes i'm so ready for it and I think it's a language barrier thing. He goes, I'm so ready for it. I've been training so hard. I have the best training partners to get ready for this fight. I've been knocked out, what he said, three times in training okay. camp. Problem is when you do that, the commission says, S come again? And they start looking into things. It was like when Kane was like, I'm having head issues. Remember that? Then Kane and Mark Hunt were like, we're, I'm, I'm having some memory issues. The UFC, it's too much of a liability. I don't care who you are. So... Um, he continues on up, up, and up. And Wednesday, when the news came out, Anderson saying they got knocked out, whatever, in the press conference. The fight was in jeopardy, and all the this press came out. It was all over. Like I remember people texting me because remember we're doing a fight campaign uh, for Jake Paul in uh, Calabasas. Remember that? Um, so we have yeah, we had Frank Mir and Jesse on fire coming. We had Sam Tripoli. All three of them texted me this. I found out to go. Hey man, I don't think the fight's going down. I guarantee it goes down. They go, no. Anderson said he got knocked out in training. I'm like, no, it's a language thing. He he's just trying to he's trying to convey to the audience that I took this so serious. I just didn't, you know, this isn't a payday. I'm here to win. I'm I'm training so hard. I'm going so hard in the paint. I'm fighting against good guys. They knocked me out. He messed up. He didn't think it was a big deal. That news goes everywhere right before the fight. So that was Thursday, Friday, right before the fight. When most of your pay-per-view buys happen, right? They don't happen days prior. They happen literally Thursday, Friday, and then day of are the biggest. So for this come out Thursday, Friday, completely fucks Jake. Mm -hmm. So um, gets knocked over and the fight was in jeopardy and all this press came out. The pre-buys tanked all the way down. The general public sees that and is like, oh, it's not happening. And these are his great points. Tommy Fury pulled out. That had nothing to do with Jake. That's a Tommy Fury thing. 
Uh, Rockman Jr. pulled out. You know, that that's a Rockman thing. That's not a Jake thing. But Jake's the biggest name, so it's a, it becomes the narrative on Jake that the fights aren't falling through. Um, so he, then he goes, oh, and Jake fucking Paul can't get an event together. This is done. It killed ticket sales. Boom, boom, boom. We're still selling tickets that day. Everything went to zero. I think we'll probably go around 200 to 300K, which is kind of upsetting. Now, 200 to 300K isn't the end of the world, especially for him. But to the level that he's at, yeah, that's not great. And did, does it have the other stuff he talks about also? Here it is. This is now as a comic too, there's a time, there's a there's a sweet spot to sell tickets. So right now is like the on season for comics. The summer's the off season. Um, but you're competing with a lot of stuff. So if you're gonna play Vegas or you're gonna play somewhere, you wanna check what's going on in that city that's gonna compete with your tickets. Especially for me, if it's if there's a big UFC in town, I'll make sure we look, you know, the UFC, thank God, announced their dates previous, you know, to the coming to town so people can buy tickets and they can market it. But let's say the UFC was in, where am I assume? Let's say the UFC was in Houston this weekend and they're doing a big paper, like a major paper. If it's a fight night, bring it on. But if it's a pay-per-view, I'm, not, I'm canceling my date. I'm not competing with it. We have a similar fan base, right? 18 to 44 males they're also in the ufc right with my background so it's going to affect my ticket sales there's certain things that you have to be privy to my team has to be privy to before we book venues it, there's more that goes into it than me just going book houston this weekend you have to look through everything because you're competing with so much now and it's inflation there's a lot that goes into it so he makes a great point here and this is how you know jake paul's becoming a master of promotion when he says this stuff this is what i like he put Halloween, World Series, Sunday football. This is the worst time of year to fight. Uh, but guess what? I had to fight. All my fights from now on will be in the summer. There's no sports, so he's not competing with anything. He's not trying to in the spotlight with Tom Brady, the World Series, who knows what God else they have going on. The UFC obviously had a fight uh, too, but it's a little different. But um, he goes, this is the worst time of year to fight. But guess what? I had to fight. All my fights from now on will be in the summer. There's no sports. There's like this perfect gap in July, early August, which is the worst time for comics because every kids aren't in school. Parents have to get babysitters um, for comics too. People are traveling, so they might not be in town. There's a lot that goes into it. Worst time to do stand up unless you're an outlier like a Tim Dillon, Kevin Hart, um, you know Joe Rogan. Unless you're a major outlier, then none of this stuff matters. But if ticket sales matter to you, and you're on the fringe of selling out or half capacity. You really got to pay attention to this stuff. It, to me, it's interesting. And there's nobody that knows ticket sales better than Burt Kreischer. For whatever reason, he has his black belt in selling tickets. Prices, venues. I talk to Burt before I do anything usually. He's the mastermind of it. Um, so he goes, I uh, had to fight, which those two fights fell out, right? Um, uh, and by the way, all my other fights were during COVID when no one had anything to do, anything to watch. Mm -hmm. I had to fight this year. I just had to get it fucking done. I'm sick and tired of waiting around. Kudos to him. Not only did he have to fight, but he had to fight fucking Anderson Silva, his toughest fight, which should have been the most pay-per-view draws. And this, to me, is so funny because the criticism on Jake Paul is fight real fighters, fight real boxers. But then you same people that criticize him bought his fight when he didn't fight, to your standards, quote-unquote, real matchups. He had a big pay-per-view share, a bigger uh, pay-per-view buys when he fought these guys that you didn't consider were real fighters. And then he fights a real fighter, Anson Silva, and you don't buy it. So what message are you sending to Jake Paul? If I'm Jake Paul and I'm about money and I'm not about getting legitimacy in fighting, I'm going to go, okay, so I fought the toughest guy in my career by far. It goes to decision. I got the knockdown, best by far my best performance, tough side of my career. I made the least amount of money. What message that you guys keep hounding him about? He's not fighting real people. He's not doing this. But then you people are buying the pay-per-view more when he's fighting less competition, but they might have a bigger name or more Instagram followers than Anderson fucking Silva. So if I'm his manager for my next step, obviously the Nate Diaz fights the fight. That's the move no matter what anybody tells him but that's the fight but also in the future it's like hey dude yeah you, you fought Anderson Silva you're fighting real guys and we know people say we want to fight you fight you we want to see you fight a real boxer but the data shows when you fight real guys if it's not if they don't have the same pull 
as far as pay-per-view buys where it's not a Woodley who's been in the UFC currently forever or it's not a Ben Askren or it's not a, you know, uh, kind of a circus act. People aren't buying it and you're risking your reputation and losses and, you know, you're fronting this whole thing, you know, and he's also lost his ass too because he says, again, these are all great points. And if you're a Jake Paul fan, this is something you sh should be excited about. He talks about how he's, fr you know, this, this MVP promotions is his thing. So when these fights fall out, remember, he has put so much money in the marketing, in the renting the venues, the staffing, his team, the other teams dealing with the other, the entire roster as far as the fight card goes, their camps, flights, hotels, security, the, all the, the, the concessions, the merch, all that stuff. His company has, when heavy lies the crown, you want to own a promotion, you have to run all that shit. Now, he's probably not putting all that together, but he's still part of it. He's still fronting it money-wise. So when that Tommy Fury fight pulls out, he's fucked money-wise. When the Rockman fight pulls out, he's fucked money-wise. Then Anderson Silva gets going and look at the draw. Anderson decides because his language barrier talks, wants to impress people and say how tough of a camp he's had getting ready for Jake Paul, which shows you he respects Jake Paul, but he really fucked up and hurt the pay-per-view numbers. So it's tough. You guys want to criticize Jake Paul and you're not fighting real guys and blah, blah, blah. And then when he fights his toughest fight, you didn't buy it. And then when he fights the toughest fight and puts on his best performance, you go, that was fake. Yeah. So if I'm Jake Paul, I'm like, I can't win. Just line up the easiest, most famous guy. Line up the easiest, most famous guy. Whether it's a real boxer, a former UFC legend, or if it's some fucking kid off YouTube with... 30,000 subscribe 30 million subscribers it doesn't matter so the message and the 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 knock on jake you guys are only adding to it if you want to see him fight real people buy the pay-per-view when he fights real people don't sit back and go that that's not that's not real blah 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 because it's toughest fight but now what you're doing is you're going to have jake go i don't know why i do it then why, why am i why am i fighting these guys give me a tough night in the office when i just beat up youtubers and you make more money you're telling me that Jake Paul wouldn't make several times more money against a guy like KSI than would Anderson Silva, according to this research? So if I'm Jake, you know, yeah, I want to be taken seriously. Yeah, I want that validation. Do you, though? Because the proof's in the pudding. You fought by far your toughest test. They really, people, I mean, 300,000 buys in this inflation and in this current climate, you know, not terrible. Mm -hmm. It's tough, right? Yeah. What else you got? Do you think that Tommy Fury fight will do better than Anderson Silva? Yes. Wow. Isn't that crazy? I know. And I love Tommy Fury. I saw one of his headlines goes, uh, what did he say? He said, Jake Paul and KSI need to fight me if they want to be taken serious in boxing. Tommy Fury, I got news for you, Bubba. Jake Paul is more of a legit boxer than had toughest fights. It's fight against fucking the basketball guy, the short guy who won the dunk contest with the toughest fight than you've ever fought. Look up your record, dude. It does nothing for Jake to fight you. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's some background there. I guess we've had some previous press. You're a reality star, dude. You just happen to be the little brother. You share the same dad, different moms. You just happen to be the brother of the greatest heavyweight of all time. That's the only reason we're inter entertaining this fight. Jake doesn't need to fight you to get validation. If anything, that's going to hurt him. You're telling me Tommy Fury's a tougher fight than Anderson Silva? Fuck you, dude. He knocks Tommy Fury out in four rounds. Easy highlight fight. You guys aren't going to buy that shit. KSI might have his hands full. I don't fucking know. I only have so much bandwidth. I can't focus on all these YouTubers boxing, trying to get into their, their dip their toe in this fight world. The reason I cover Jake, he's a buddy, and he takes it god damn serious mm -hmm. and he actually has talent these other guys they're just doing it because the cool thing to do jake would do it no matter what that's why i respect jake yeah these other guys are just doing to cash in what else you got all right here's some news on paulo costa um he posted about his him not being happy with his contract. he's a wild boy man he's i respect funny. costa more and more mm -hmm. from his his he's a great follow too He'll talk some shit. He's trolled your boy. He's a he's a fun follow though. <laughs> he's a fun follow. So he put my miserable <laughs> my miserable contract with the UFC was up in a few short 
What's up? And well, that's just his translation. So yep, we'll be another up. problem. Get mm-hmm. his translation. Get the guys in trouble. All right. Uh, my miserable contract with UFC is up in a few short months. He put was up. If it was up, it would be expired, right? Um, my miserable contract with UFC was up in a few short months. Will expire in time. A new hashtag boxers coming to town. Boy, I'd love to see him and Jake Paul fight. That'd be a fun one. That would be fun. So, yeah, he mentioned the boxing thing, and he's also saying that USADA, they're doing it again where they're testing him at 5 in the morning. What? Yeah. So he has, like, proof of it, too. I think the UFC is using USADA as a door weapon to annoy these those who don't want to renew their miserable contract. That's his theory that... I can't believe USADA's here at 5 a.m. again. It's unbelievable. This is unbelievable. Will they come every single day at 5 a.m.? Fuck USADA. <laughs> I'm with him, man. It's like, again... USADA is an employ- employee of the UFC. They're not a, a outsourced. Uh, the, the, they work in the UFC offices. The UFC hired them. The UFC pays their salaries. And I thought Dana said they're getting rid of the 5 a.m. shit. He's like, this is ridiculous. Yes, Especially during time. fight week. Now, maybe it's just during fight week, which I agree with, 5 a.m. at fight week. or Anytime before 8 a.m. on fight week is atrocious. These guys need their sleep. Sleep's more important than anything they can do it's mm-hmm. so goddamn important so to disrupt that is just unprofessional you got to take care of your clients with this though if it's you know if it's 5 a.m it's a once off 5 a.m you're trying to bust a guy all right i get it but if it's happening all the time there's something to paul Custis thing because you know you don't see a ton of other guys getting busted at 5 a.m mm-hmm. very shady but that's part of the problem man it's like you know I've had Woodley on the show many times on food truck. He goes, yeah, th- talking all that shit to the UFC was a mistake, man. You don't realize. Like, they can make your life fucking miserable. And for Costa, you know, come off the winner against Luke Rockhold, which is one of the sloppiest fights of all time. But, you know, he's coming off a win, but still not like, I guess, what, six in the world? The UFC can make your life very, very difficult. Very difficult meaning this. If you don't play by their rules, you're literally going to get the worst matchup possible. So the, what they do, they go, Paul Costa's being difficult. All right. And then maybe you saw it goes, here's our list for testing guys this week. We have po- po- uh, Costa at 5 a.m. The UFC's not going to be like, no, don't do that to him. They're like, yeah, fucking right. do it. And then also matchup-wise, God, who, who could beat this guy? So he can ruin his value when he leaves here and tries to box Jake Paul. Mm-hmm. That's all they're going to do. So you just, you just hold your cards tight to your chest. I learned that. I remember when I was – very first going through my issues with Dana and UFC and Reebok deal, Rashad called me. He's like, now's not the time, dude. Save it. Save it. They're going to make your life fucking miserable. You're, you're literally working for a company, you know? Yeah. And if the boss has power over you, which they do, because there's a reason why Dana's the boss, if you're a smart guy, did some strategic moves to get in that position, he can make your life a living hell. And making your life a living hell, it's not like he works at Thick Boy where, let's say, Casey was the problem. I, I can't really make Casey's life too difficult. I give you some shit projects, I guess, you know, where you're like, all right, dude, but it's not awful. There's not much I can do. In combat sports, dude, Dana can make your life very difficult. Oh, here's the worst matchup possible. Mm. Difficult by worst matchup possible. We're going to put you on the prelims. Look at Roger Huerta. Learn from Roger Huerta. Now, these young fighters, they probably never heard of Roger Huerta. Roger Huerta was a Mexican-American kid who looked like a fucking Calvin Klein model and could fight his ass off and burst on the scene. He was the first fighter ever featured on Sports Illustrated. There's a picture of him, I think it's against Kenny uh, Florian, him fucking kicking him in the face against the cage. And he rose to power and got pretty famous and then started talking shit. Do you know what happened to Roger Huerta? If you haven't heard of him, he's fighting over in Asia now, getting kicked in the face for, I don't know, rising or one championship. There he is. Mm-hmm. That's, I think, I'm, I don't know, too brutal of the future. Look at that. America's fastest growing, most controversial sport. That's back in the day, yeah, dude. I remember those days. And Roger Huerta had all this momentum against the man. He, he spoke well. He looked the part. He was in movies. He was dating that redhead from that 70s show. Remember her, that oh, yeah. time piece? Mm. I mean, you're talking, he's living the fucking life, man. And then he got very difficult, started demanding money, started demanding the stuff. The UFC went, cool story, buddy. Check this out. You're not main event anymore. Matter of fact, you're not even, you're not even the main card anymore. We're going to put you on the prelims against Gray Maynard. And then you lose that, you're cut. And it was like Mission Impossible for him. 
fighters need to learn, man. And like I told you, Woodley said, it was one of my biggest regrets. I shouldn't have done it at the time because they made my life very difficult. There's just no upside to it. Wait till you're in, you know, if you're one foot out, one foot in, you have one fight left, let them market you on that fight, win that fight. And if you know you're leaving, then start talking that shit. But what Paulo Costa is doing, it's just not good. They're going to get you, man. Nobody's ever won. Nobody's ever won. Mm -hmm. They'll suppress all your shit, all your shit, everything. Look at Dan Hardy being difficult. Was part of the UFC, was part of that BTS uh, broadcast, which to me is the best in the world. They're the, you know, they're the marquee uh, lineup for breaking down fights. I love all those guys. Bisbing's on there. They're all fantastic. And the reason Bisbing uh, filled in now is because Dan Hardy's not there anymore. UFC can make your life very difficult. Oh, get him out of there. He has his reptile, you know, reptilian mind uh, show or whatever. He's probably full the reptile. full reptile. He's the smartest mind we have in the game. It's such a shame they don't use him. And then with Dana has a press conference, and there's a lot of sheep out there with what Dana says has huge influence, right? So Dana goes, yeah, he was being aggressive with a girl. Well, most people aren't listening to me. Most people aren't listening to Dan Hardy. The majority of fans go, dang, can you believe Dan Hardy got fired because he was sexually assaulting that girl or whatever fuck crazy narrative that the UFC comes up with? Because all they're going to do is try and devalue. Devalue so what you say doesn't have the same weight to it. Me with Dan, that kid's an idiot. Ah, fuck that guy. Okay. Okay. You know? Uh. So for these fighters currently in the UFC doing that, just don't, man, don't, yeah, there's, back off. there's no upside, dude. They're going to ruin your life. Be smart about it. Be strategic about it. Know exactly what you have. And then if you do have a platform like a podcast or even your social media, wait till you win your next fight and they give you a big fight and they give you the marketing for it. They give you your bonus. Because there's another thing. It's going to affect you financially too because you're not going to get your bonus. They're going to give it to somebody else. You know, you're not going to get those sponsorships they're giving to everybody else. You're not going to get marketed. You're not going to be on the main card. There's no upside to it. Get your star as big as possible. And if you're on that side of the fence, like, man, fuck the UFC. As soon as I'm out of here, then I'm, then release the hounds. You know? Mm. That's the move. All righty. And um, also for, for Costa, last thing on this, for Costa, let's say you want to fight with Jake Paul, right? They're giving you a terrible matchup. But if you want that fight with Jake Paul, the UFC is going to give you the worst matchup possible to, uh, the, via Nate Diaz until they pull that whole UFC 279 conspiracy theory, right? So they were trying to do it to Nate Diaz. It just didn't work out for him. But what they're going to do is give you the worst matchup possible, and let's say you get knocked down that fight. Well, now Paulo Casa, that fucks you monetarily, money-wise, when you go to ask for that fight against Jake Paul. Jason, you know, yeah, your star is kind of diminished. You got knocked in last fight. People aren't really paying attention. But there's a lot of factors that go into that. Yeah, people weren't paying attention because the UFC didn't give you a spotlight. They didn't even put your fight on the website. People didn't know you were fighting. Like, they make it really difficult, man. Okay. But also, what do you expect? Would you guys do it any other way? If you're Dana, these guys are talking shit to you. You have to show your power, I guess. Yeah, you're like, okay, cool, dude. Beep, beep, ESPN, a.k.a. Mickey Mouse, my boss. Here's what's going on, Paulo Costa. Cool, say less. Your tweets aren't getting retweeted. Your countdown shit's not, you're no longer on the countdowns. Your merch is, for whatever reason, not selling well. Weird. You know what I'm saying? They can make it very difficult. There's no upside. No fighter in the history of fighting has ever won that battle. Say Connor did. Connor talked some shit to Dana. But remember, that's... Connor on a yacht in Gucci pajamas mm -hmm. with four hundred million dollars in the bank because he played. I'm sure he has some issues with the OC. You never heard about it till after he was on that yacht on a boat many many miles away. They can't really fuck with him. Maybe he, he he put out Dana's DMs to him. Remember that? Yeah, a long time. Yeah, but that's a he, he's he's a an outlier. Yeah, for the rest of you, it ain't gonna work, man. What else you got? All right, this is kind of related to. Paulo Costa, but it's more funny than anything. So do you remember way back that Colby Covington said that he was hooking up with Pollyanna, Pollyanna Viana? No, she's like that. They're actually, I think they did teammates and stuff as well, but then their teammate that was his girlfriend for a while. I think so. He was saying that they were hooking up. She said that they weren't. That's a picture of them together too. Do me a favor. Go back. Mm -hmm. 
go back to the title. Yeah, Polly Amir makes X ray claim about Colby. Let me see that. That's one day ago. So that's <laughs> oh, this, this, yeah, this is where it's going to. So she before she denied that they had something together, but then now she did like a question and answer thing with someone in the MA media, kind of a fun game thing. And then she admitted, so this is the, this is, the guy's name is Alex Behunin, who does these question games, whatever. Humanizing athletes. Let's mm -hmm. ask about your sex past. So That's not nice. So these are all the favorite stuff, right? Favorite food. Favorite food, pasta, favorite drink, Coke. Regular Coke, or we're talking about Coke Zero. Favorite color, black, dark. Favorite two show, never heard of it. Favorite video game, never heard of it. Favorite band, never heard of it. Mm -hmm. Favorite place to travel, France, never been. Favorite fighter, Amanda Nunes, makes sense. Favorite all-time fight to watch, Johanna versus Wele. Favorite knockout, Aaron Silva, Vitor Belfort. I like that. Favorite sport to watch other than MMA, CrossFit. Interesting. Favorite submission, practice, arm locks. Favorite hobby, watching anime. Okay. And then she posted this too. <laughs> Kobe wanted me to finger him in the ass, but I did not want to. He got upset. Hilarious. So she's basically. <laughs> she's kind of leaning into it yeah. though. Yeah. Still doesn't confirm it, but that's hilarious. Yeah. And then Paula Costa also commented on this as well uh kobe wanted me to finger him last but i don't want to get upset mm -hmm. and hold, 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 go please don't accuse kobe of being gay i just uh, just because pollyanna said she stuck her finger in his ass and then um you're very childish respect his sexual taste is so just face. post this little video here secret juice <laughs> <laughs> Dude, I'm telling you, he's a great follower. Yeah, dude, out of nowhere, too. He's so funny. Yeah, he's he's hilarious. Mm. Um, Him and Jake Paul would be not so. Yeah. I wonder how big of a difference they are body-wise. I know. That's a good point, Jen. Well, um, so this is Sean O'Malley. Um, when MMA Junkie said, with Aljamain Sterling planning to sit until June, Henry Cejudo proposes an interim title fight with Sean O'Malley, and then Sean O'Malley wrote this, that he'd rather fight someone who deserves it, like Cheeto. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I'm with I'm with uh I, listen, you know, Cheeto's my boy. Love Sugar. That, that makes sense to me for interim fight and they have that that weird history, right? Yep. Where Sugar doesn't say it was a real fight, it wasn't a loss, his leg blew out. I think it was due to the leg kicks from Cheeto. So run it back. I, yeah, interim great title. To see it back. And that only builds Sugar's thing. And also, out of all the matchups, that's a good one. Mm -hmm. So who does not a good matchup for any of them? Yeah. So who is a nightmare for all of them? And one more with uh Sean O'Malley. So remember Sean O'Malley. So Bryce Mitchell before the Peter Yan fight. I may say good. Yeah, he was like, congrats, but you did not win that fight. Yeah. And then Sugar was like, this come from a guy who has sex with his sister or something like that. His dad had sex with his sister. Then, yeah. So then, so we played that video already. And then Your dad Bryce, fucked his sister to make you. Oh, interesting. Yeah. And then Bryce Mitchell heard that. Hold on a second. So Bryce Mitchell heard that in this week. He called me inbred. I'm going to deal with that when I see him. He said it's on site when he sees him, yep. huh? It's on site. And then this is what Sean O'Malley ended up saying at the end. Never called Bryce an inbred. And it's pretty much, that's it. Um. So he just said I never called Bryce inbred. He just said your dad had sex with his sister. Yeah, that, that'd be that inbred. video. So he alluded to it. Of course. I'm sure Sean has respect for him. Different weight classes, right? And Bryce just said that he... He expected Jan to win anyways in the beginning. Like, he picked Jan over. Yeah, I didn't have a, see, this is a thing it's with comics, too. Like, everyone's so sensitive. You say anything, especially with fighters. Like, Bisbing has this problem. DC has this problem. But especially Bisbing lately with, you know, uh, Nate Diaz uh, made fun of him because he said, you know, uh, Jake could be a problem for him. You know, J Jake poses a lot of threats to him. For what we do, guys like Bisbing or uh, Chael, me, not so much Luke because he is an analyst, but for guys like Dan Hardy, Dan Hardy really doesn't pick fights, but Bisbing well, I well, Chael well, you're going to offend certain people. Man. And, but also, like, that's part of the gig, man. Like, I can't just come on and, like, obviously I didn't pick Chandler and uh, Poirier. I wish they weren't fighting. I love both of them. But other than that, I always make picks, and it pisses some people of off, man. Yeah. It's just they're so sensitive. So, you know, for Bryce, you know, it's tough. You're going to piss people off, man. Mm -hmm. So there was rumors going around that Charles Oliveira was going to fight Rafael Fazeev in January. I'm with, I'm with Charles Oliveira. Yeah, so then he kind of pretty much break. denied Thank it. Right I'm, I'm with him. There's no upside for Charles Oliveira. 
tough matchup. Fazeev's a monster. It needs to be Fazeev and Gaethje, straight up. Mm. But I'm with Charles. Like, no, I just lost my belt. I, I'm not fighting this monster at six. It's not happening. He should be fighting Darius. Fazeev should be fighting Justin Gaethje. End of story. So this is the press conference, and this is Israel Adesanya and Alex Pereira doing a stare down. But it, it looks pretty trippy. I'll just show you. To win on Saturday, a potential fight between yourself and Israel Adesanya. It seems to be heading in that direction. What's your final message to Israel at points? And of course, so both he turns of you to first. win on Saturday, Stop a potential it. fight between yourself and Israel Adesanya. It seems to be heading in that direction. What's your? That guy just looks freaking. Scary. He's a Brazilian <laughs> fucking Terminator, man. Yeah, super I, you scary. know, and I, I get all the hype on him, you know, and it always takes me a long to get on a guy's bandwagon unless you're Sean Brady or certain guys. Makachev, I was late to the party. Francis, I was late to the party. Pierre, I'm late to the party. I just, you know, I know everybody's on his Brazilian Terminator nuts. I just, I don't think you guys realize how good Izzy is. Mm. I really don't. It's And it's, it's uh, honestly, it's disrespectful. It really is. Mm -hmm. Even my brother in Houston is like, oh, I can't wait to see that Pierre guy fight. Brian, I'm sure I'm fine. Kid. Me and Brian have a $5,000 bet on it. Jeez. $5,000. Because Brian, again, my brother, Brian, they've never seen Pierre fight besides the Sean Strickland fight. Oh, dude, he's going to destroy his team. Like, what? In what world? Mm -hmm. I know he's scary. He's the next big thing. You'll see he paints him like he's this Brazilian Terminator. It's disrespectful. <laughs> Y'all must have forgot. I hear you. But is you know it how fucking good Izzy is at fighting. You know how much more experience he is at this level? It's also Madison Square Garden. So it's not like he's fighting a fight night. It's not like he's fighting in, you know, in the UFC in uh, Vegas, you know, at T-Mobile Arena. It's not like they're fighting Phoenix or Houston or wherever. Bro, they're fighting at the Mecca, the Mecca of all fighting. So if already we don't know how he deals with 25 minutes in the spotlight, it just amplifies that. To Izzy, it's not during the office. Mm-hmm. I'm going to take that guy. I think the only thing that was just, I mean, for me, it's just a mental thing. You know, having lost two times to the same guy, that's the only thing that I would say. Yeah. Otherwise. I think there's something there. There's something to be said about that. I think early on, you're going to see Izzy very strategic, very lasered focus, and probably not taking a lot of chances early on because that's in the back of his mind. Mm -hmm. But I also think things happen for a reason, and those knockouts allowed Izzy to become the you know, the best mixed martial artist on the planet because he learned, all right, I do all this training. We come up with a game plan. And then against certain guys like a Piera, if I don't take the game plan and, you know, I, I try to match these guys, you know, in a, in a phone booth fight, it just gives them a opportunity to loot, to win. So he's, he's learned from that. The only time we've ever seen him have a kind of hiccup like that in the UFC was against Kelvin Gaslam, top three middleweight fights of all time. And, I hate to tell you, he won that fight. Mm. But he learned from that, you know? I don't think we see that out of him. Yeah. Um, this is Alex Perry's sister. So she's, a, I didn't know she was a kickboxer as well, but now she's going to be fighting in LFA in MMA. But Sick. I'll show you uh, one of her fights here. She's savage like him. The yeah. certain glory. Damn, the, that family is trouble. She's tenacious like the brother. She's the younger sister, huh? She's a uh, And she's very, very tall, too. You can see. Well, yeah, they're just, they're just genetic tall. freaks, man. Uh, I'm sure you saw this video, no? Yeah, where they pick <laughs> she up She picks Francis. up with Francis and Ghana. Look how big Francis is. I know he's got to be weighing over 265 there, right? Because he's not freak. Yeah. So that was pretty crazy. Um, this was from a one championship <sighs> fight. I'm not sure which one, but he actually dent he got his leg dented by a kick. Is that it looks that swollen. Oh, that guy just he went oh. fuck this, and the guy just went I've had enough. He kicked so oh my yeah. god. So that was pretty nasty. Jesus Christ. Um, this I just thought was just cool because Conor McGregor, he had a beard, finally shaved it yeah, off. I don't like him clean shaved. <laughs> I know I know he did it for his Halloween outfit where his mom went blackface. But You saw um, that too? Yeah. I mean, poor taste. Huh? What yeah. do you think? I mean, she said it was not that, but 
Um, oh, this is okay. People are, I guess they're calling him out on this because it seems like he's, he's losing touch. They're saying like he's a 60 year old uncle on Facebook or something, thinking something's funny, but this is what he posted. It's terrifying. I just don't know what it is. But is he in makeup for a movie? What is this? It looks I like he's shooting Roadhouse, so there's no gorilla. I have no in Roadhouse. clue. But his thing's also, you know, his gorilla, the, the walk, that's mm-hmm. from a gorilla. His tattoo on his chest, gorilla, so it matches. I up. guess so. <laughs> Whatever. Know, it is, it's content. I mean. And here's the last one. It's just Chael Sonnen talking about MMA math. It's kind of messed math, up. MMA math will always add up. Example, Connor plus Khabib equals only business. Henry Suda. As well as five foot man, DC a towel, the right weight, could be term of Sue, missed weight, term of Sue, music, boogeyman, Arnold Allen, Gaethje, Nico Price equals one brain. Oh, interesting. He kind of went hard on them, yeah. Interesting. Mm hmm. Huh. Yeah. All righty. I think that's pretty much it. Um, you pretty much covered the fights already, too. But if you want. Yep, went over the fights. Yep. So, yeah, Saturday night. Uh, no uh, Calabas fight command because I'll be on the road in Houston. I'm in Houston this Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Houston Improv. We have a special appearance, me and the Thick Boy Squad at the Specs downtown uh, Houston. I'll put it on my profile today so you guys can get the exact um, address. But um, that's Saturday at the Specs downtown Houston. Come try the award winning Tiger Thick. Come get a bottle. We'll have merch there. I'll be there. The camera crews will be there. It's going to be a grand old time. That's from 12 to 2 in Houston at Specs downtown. The exact address will be on my social media. And then Thursday, one show. Friday, two shows. Saturday, two shows. Friday's almost sold out. So let's get working on Thursday, Saturday, Houston, Texas. Uh, Meg the Stallion will be there twerking for Tiger Thick. That's not true. And then next week, I'm in Milwaukee, just Friday and Saturday. Kid has a game on Thursday, so we're only doing Friday, Saturday in Milwaukee. Milwaukee Improv, Jeffrey Dahmer Tour, you best believe your boys going to be doing something for that. And then Providence, Rhode Island's almost sold out December 1st through the 3rd. Providence, Rhode Island, can't wait, never been, looking forward to it. Washington, D.C., D.C. Improv, one of my favorite clubs in the country, December 15th through the 17th. Get your tickets at thickboy.com. We just released new Thick Boy Diet merch on Thick Boy as well. You can also get Tiger Thick on thickboy.com. We got it all there for you guys. Get the new stealth uh, camo collection, sweatshirts, shorts, hoodies. We got the hats, jerseys. We got it all, man. But the new uh, Thick Boy Diet just dropped. So get you some right now. Thick Boy Diet. It has a steak knife, a donut, whiskey. That's my diet. I have high cholesterol, whatever. Thickboy.com. Get your Tiger Thick there as well. All right? Enjoy UFC 281 this weekend. Saturday night, Izzy, Alex Pierre. It's going down. Coleman event, Carlos Sparza, uh, Zhang Weilei. And then you also have Dustin Poirier, Michael Chandler, Frank Yeager's last fight, Dan Hooker looking to redeem himself, Brad Riddell, Renato Meccano. That's a great fight. Dominic Reyes is coming back. Molly the Meatball McCann is on there, big underdog. And then my boy Andre Petrosi is about to mop the floor with his guy. That is all going down this mother truck in Saturday on UFC pay-per-view from Masson Square Garden, baby. So that's it. But Houston, I will see you this weekend. I uh, can't wait to see everybody. And then Milwaukee's after that. Um, thank you, guys. Thanks for watching. Hopefully you enjoyed it. Love you guys. Food truck this week will be with Al Jermaine Sterling. Holler at your boy. That drops on Thursday on Thick Boy. Get you some. Love you guys. Be safe. Till next time, I'm out. If you're into Thick Boys, <laughs> like, subscribe, comment, and God bless America. Well, that's not my big one. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs>